We often talk about color in the landscape and plant design, but we don't often talk about fragrance, and we should. So Cindy Townsend is here to give us some ideas about how to have a fragrant garden. Well, and the reason that we should talk about it, Jennifer, you know, Linda Shackelford and I went to a little deal at OSU, and they had the vendors there. And as soon as you walk in the door, they had the potpourris. And Linda and I both stopped. And Linda's like, no, we can't stay here. We'll be stuck here the whole time <laughs> because of the aroma. And, mm -hmm. and you know, the potpourris are just amazing. That you, the things you can yeah, create. We, and you want we were to smelling this walking by, and it really makes you stop. Well, and you want to recreate this in the garden as best you can. So let's yeah. start with the bones, okay. the structure of the garden. And the way we can do this is, you know, we can incorporate some magnolias. Um, which do really wonderful here in Oklahoma and you know when they're blooming you can take the magnolia flowers and float them in bowls and do all kinds of stuff uh, but this would be a great structural bones and then people don't think about the Arizona cypress um, for ar aroma in the garden but these are just amazing smell this Jennifer it's just I love the smell it's Christmas it is isn't that amazing it, it is it's a isn't Christmas tree oh, and, and so that's you awesome could, you've got a nice textural blend and color blend just in these two items if you pull it on down, we can do the Gilt Edge Iliagnus, which also has a great aroma. And when the aroma comes out on this one, it's in the fall when you're not even thinking about it so much. Mm -hmm. This baby will bloom, and you won't even realize where the aroma is coming from. And it has kind of a honeysuckle smell to it. <laughs> so here, now we've got this perfect combination of blues, yellows, greens, broadleaf, fine leaf. And, and, if, and this, this one's a little bit short. It's only about three to four feet. Okay. If you need a tall wall, then you can do the standard Iliagnus, uh, which can get six, seven, eight feet even. And this would make you a nice uh, barrier or you know screen, uh, but then add aroma and texture to the landscape mm -hmm. as well. And I stuck some echinaceas in here. And echinacea, the cone flower, also has a great aroma to it. You kind of have to get close to smell it. But you can use it to cut flower, to oh. beautify the garden, to arom uh, you know add aroma to the garden. Mm -hmm. Uh, then if, if we, let's say we've got a paver garden, we've got the flagstone or something mm -hmm. like that. This is Corsican mint and it's just something, it's, it's something that can be in the Steppables program. Again, Jennifer, just amazing, amazing smell when you walk on it. Smell hmm. that. Yeah, oh, that's fantastic. So now we've got the bones and we've got mm -hmm. the floor and we've got the barriers and all that kind of stuff. I, I keep sending this to the crew so they can smell it too. <laughs> keep going. <laughs> well, we've got the Santalina also. This Santalina is very drought tolerant and it's great for Oklahoma gardening. Um, actually, I've seen it kind of go down even when we've had too many rains. So mm -hmm. you might bring it up a little bit and make sure it's kind of like your real lavender. Uh, make sure it's aerated from underneath. It's a little um, bit of a Mediterranean. It is absolutely care. Mediterranean. Yeah. And, and, and here's the little flowers that it gives. They're not real significant, but kind of interesting. So you can either keep it low and kind of make it do what you want it to do or let it grow up to its full form. Uh, then, of course, we have the lilacs. Everybody kind of thinks of the lilacs for the, for the aroma in the spring. Uh, the bloomerang reblooms. So you have a little bit of a border and, and aroma there, too. And as the Agastache queen, I cannot resist yes. telling you about the Agastache. Um, because with the Agastache, they're out of the mint family, and you've got all different colors and textures of Agastache. You've even got gold foliage with the Agastache with blue flowers. And then you can go high with some of your Agastache. Some of them get pretty tall, and you can stay in the 18-inch range. Well, if you look at their leaf, you can see that it, it's related to the mint family, Yeah, too. it's got the square stem. Very similar. Yeah, it's got the square stem. So then over here, I put this little denny together. I really love this. Um, one of my favorites is the Kent's Beauty Oregano, which is an ornamental oregano. And I've told the story before how we were in Oregon at a show and it just stopped me because what happens is it develops little blue flowers all in the bracts mm. of, of this one. And mine at home is blooming beautifully and it's on my wall and it's trailing down. It looks absolutely gorgeous. These haven't caught up to that yet. Now, what, would this be a perennial? Yes, absolutely. Wonderful. It likes well-drained soil, kind of a Mediterranean thing again. Um, but this would work, you know, I've got it in my garden, in my beds, by a retaining wall, as well as hanging on my wall that I have for my patio. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the purple basils. Ba basils make me melt. I love the smell of basil, and of course you associate that with cooking and, and spaghetti and whatever else, tomatoes. And I'll, I'll deadhead mine in the garden, and the herb garden, just to keep them blooming, and keep them growing, rather. And I just love it. I mean, I could just stay there for hours because of the smell. It's oh, I know. I love, I love basil. And then here we've got some pineapple sage. And see, the pineapple sage has some yellow hues to it, and the pineapple sage also gets the red salvia-like flowers. This one's barely showing itself, but it's there. And then here we have the salvia gregi that's really showing itself. So both of these products are very aromatic. And you can even put this in a pot, a patio pot, and just have that be the only plant um, for your patio and it'll give you that pineapple smell. I mean, have you smelled this one, Jennifer? Well, we're just going to keep on doing this. Yeah, well, it's an aromatic segment. 
and here, right here, I want to show you. This is gardenia, and smell my smell my lotion. It's a gardenia lotion, mm -hmm. so we can have gardenias in the in the uh, garden also. Um, this is a annual type, so you need to take this one in in the winter time to protect it. So you might put it in a patio pot. But the gardenias are actually wonderful and got a nice shiny, dark, glossy leaf. And this rose right here, this beautiful yellow rose, there's not very many shrub roses that have a good aroma to them, mm -hmm. but this Julia Child rose is disease and insect resistant. Oh, and it's and beautiful. And then it has aroma and, a, and it's a re-bloomer for the garden. So this is an ideal, ideal rose. Bon appetit. Uh, no, it's wonderful. <laughs> um, then of course we've got the salvias. I don't want to skip the monardas. Here's a beautiful purple monardas, showing a little bit, it's trying to be a little bit spent here. But it's got the beautiful tubular flowers for the hummingbirds and wildlife. It's kind of flat for the butterflies. Um, but Monarda is in the mint family also and has a lot of color and texture and aroma for the garden. Then right here we've got the Evelyn Salvia. Um, any of the salvias will work. It doesn't matter which variety, which texture, which anything. Any of your salvias will work. And Russian Sage. Russian Sage is also an excellent backdrop for things because it can mm -hmm. get some height. You get the little spires, the shorter ones. But this one, you know, gets about two to three feet tall. And I like the Russian sage, too, because it, it's a wonderful backdrop plant for something really fun and bright in the front. It, it makes, yeah. Like a coneflower. It works really well. It, it does. It's, it's a nice backdrop. And then right here, I want to cover this real quick, if we can. We've got the, the snowdrift clematis, and this is an evergreen clematis. Um, I love the foliage on it, for one thing. Is it that does, new? Well, it's been around for a little while, but we don't, it kind of comes in and out. We don't get to have it very often. And when this baby's blooming with its panicles of flowers, it is just amazing. You kind of walk by the aisle and it catches you. So there's a lot to love about this plant. And then I thought to give it a nice clean look, we've got sage. This is uh, a salvia uh, officinalis. So it's a tricolor sage, which gives you a nice, clean look. Again, it's one that you might want to keep cutting on to, to get the bushiness. But see how beautiful and clean it looks, and then it's culinary at the same time. Um, so I really love that. And then I the, mix the centronella plant with it to keep the mosquitoes away. <laughs> yeah, you and know. the sage will come back every year. And sometimes, I'm like, like last year, it was just stayed evergreen. Yeah, it is beautiful. And there's about three different varieties that we sell here. Mm -hmm. So you can pretty much, I like this one here because of the brightness of the color. Um, so that's the reason I pulled this one into the segment. Do most of these need full sun? Yeah, pretty much. I don't think there's anything in here. I mean, the Iliagnus you could probably put in part shade, but most everything in this segment uh, is full sun. So, and then I kind of watch that with my patio garden. You know, um, you want shade because you need to feel cooler and better, but I try to make a filtered situation to where I can have some of my full sun stuff in there too mm -hmm. to give me the aroma that I need uh, when I'm on the patio. At the end of a long day. Oh my gosh, long day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. Thank you.